should I start? Okay, thank you uh, for the organizer to give us a chance to introduce BIOS. So um, we design BIOS just like the device to booting up the computer. And we want to empower our students uh, with skills to start their own authentic research early and uh, to cultivate the next generation of the young scientists. So this project or this course started about <laughs> four years ago. And at that time, it was very challenging and uh, still now. And so first, it, there are many demands from society on our and how, hoping us can train students meeting all these needs, but there are no successful paths, uh, case in the past for us, for us to follow. And also we start to realize that students are less interested in biology and there's a decline of students directly enrolled in our major. And also um, faculties may have different things about our students. On the other side, uh, as uh, the students with the economic growth and uh, more and more frequent uh, communication with the outside world, they realize being a scientist is not the only way and there are so many other lifestyles. And um, some higher uh, high school education also let them think that biology is not challenging. And uh, also, um, well, but, but because biology is about uh, life and it's the foundation of the human health and uh, the curing disease, so there are still the students want to do life science uh, research. And at that point, they, they have problem which is lack, lacking the confidence and the confidence in research skills. And that's where BIOS come in. And we designed the um, BIOS program with very specific goals. And we want to um, let them to achieve these. And next will be the Justin who will uh, let you know how we did it and how it works. That was quick. All right, I just want to get a feel. How many of you are non-science people? Non-science. One, two, three, okay, about half of you roughly. All right, that's good. So this, my part of the talk is actually geared more towards you folks. So I'm going to start talking about science-related things. But then I'm going to try to relate it to one specific aspect of our program, which I think is very important and very applicable to just about any academic field. So first I'm going to give you a little bit of overview of what BIOS looks like structurally. So BIOS is a summer program. It goes for about two, uh, one and a half months. And it has three basic parts. The first part is a basic training uh, series, which lasts about three days, where we have new students come in. We assume they know nothing. And we give them basic training in lab safety, how to handle glassware, how to work with reagents, things like this. And then they participate in two different 15-day, what we call, topical modules. And a topical module is essentially a learning unit that contains learning activities where the students get to experience between four and eight different types of exper experiments that are unique to different areas of biology. So either biochemistry, cell biology. So each of these modules contains experimental techniques that the students will learn that are unique to that area. But not only are they unique to that area, this is also where we get into this idea of authentic research experience. These techniques are ones that are actually being used by real labs on food on campus. So the idea is for students to come in, learn these techniques, and when they become competent, they can then become immediate plug and play students who can go to a lab and start contributing to meaningful research immediately. So that's kind of the goal. Um, so from a student's perspective, they take a basic training, and then they do have some choice of what to take. It, they give us a list of what rank order topics they want, and based on that, we place them into one, each, uh, one, one module in each segment. So they have two different topical modules. So when you take one of these topical modules and you break it down into a daily schedule, it looks something like this. And as you can see, there are many different types of activities that we try to have them learn. So we do a lot of discussions where the students are given different science ideas to think about. They debate concepts. Um, they also have proposal time where they are asked to uh, create experimental designs that they'll actually go do, and also to uh, make predictions about what they think will happen with their experiments. And then, of course, there's a lot of experiment time. And then we have some workshops where the students learn very specific skills that we want them to learn. For instance, how to write good reports, how to do statistics for the data that they get, and with these skills, they then have some time to write their reports and to uh, prepare their findings to share with each other. And I'm really glad that uh, Dr. Smith went first because a lot of the principles that she was talking about are what we use in a lot of these activities. Constructivist environments, active learning, scientific teaching-based principles, um, discovery, inquiry-based learning, group activities, uh, a lot of different 
ideas are incorporated into these different activities. So that's basically what it looks like. But the thing I want to talk about, which again I, is very relevant, I think, to everybody, regardless of what academic your area for, you're from, is this idea of assessments. And the idea that I would like you to consider is that assessing knowledge is very different from assessing skill. And for us, because BIOS is based on giving students lab skills and being able to work at the bench and create correct uh, experimental results, assessing the skills is really important to us because we have to know, are the things we're doing working? So assessments of knowledge, that's something that we've been around a long time, right? Uh, short answer questions, long answer questions, small choice questions. So these are things that we're very familiar with. But assessments of skill get a little harder. And Dr. Smith did mention uh, briefly that she did assessments of application and things like this. So that also starts to become more an assessment of skill. Are they able to use these concepts and combine them in a certain way? Are they able to solve certain problems? So we're in the US, so we might as well talk about baseball. So baseball, if I want to see, is a person good at playing baseball? Are they competent in baseball skills? How do I do it? The answer for the multi-billion dollar baseball industry is they create metrics. So they measure things. So if you're a pitcher, they'll measure things like you know, how many home runs you allowed, how many strikeouts you had. So they try to quantify your performance in these different ways. And you can see pretty quickly that in sports, most of the things that they quantify are outcomes. They are the results of your performance. Did you win? Did you lose? How many points did you score? And this is kind of the approach that we started out with in trying to assess lab skill competence for our students in BIOS. So we're trying to create these kinds of metrics, these measures, to see whether or not they can perform the tasks that we want them to perform. But we take this a step further. So instead of just looking at the outcomes, we also try to look at the process. At each step in the process of doing a particular experiment, do they do each step correctly? And these are the things that we try to quantify. So let's say, and I'm going to give two examples now. The first one's going to be science, and the second one is going to be non-science. So please don't fall asleep until I get to the second one. Um, the, the science example is growing bacteria in the lab. So this is a very basic uh, operation in the lab to be able to grow bacteria correctly. And if you break this down into steps for the process or the operation, there are essentially three basic steps. The first is preparing some growth media, which essentially is a liquid solution with food in it so the bacteria can grow. The second step is inoculating this media with cells, so putting the bacteria you want to grow into the media, but making sure that nothing else gets in there, because you only want to grow your bacteria. And then growing this mixture under the appropriate conditions, again, avoiding contamination so that you don't grow something else. And when you take any one of these steps and you decompress it into the tasks that you actually have to perform to meet this, this step, you find that there are actually quite a few tasks. So when preparing growth media, for instance, you have to be able to correctly calculate the different reagents that you're going to mix together to make this media. You also have to mix them together using the right technique in the right way. And then you also have to sterilize the solution so that other th if there's any bacteria that's already in there, you kill them off so that they don't grow later. So what we did was we took, we made really elaborate rubrics for all of these different tasks. And we tried, we literally had our TAs sitting there while the students are doing their experiments to watch whether or not they can perform all of these tasks correctly. So it's very labor intensive, but again, it measures not only the outcome, i.e. did the bacteria grow, but it also looks to see at each step, each task, what are they getting wrong and what are they not getting wrong. And so, for instance, for this rubric, the top three items here, the first thing that they had to do in order to perform this operation was to select the correct bench to work on. So in a lab, there are many different types of benches, and the one that they're supposed to use is what we call the clean bench. So this rubric item, they get points if they can pick the correct bench. Then they also have to do UV ultraviolet pretreatment on the bench. So they have to sterilize the bench to make sure that there's nothing there to contaminate their samples. So if they did that, they get a point. And then they also have to perform operations close to an alcohol burner. So they have the flame where they sterilize their tools and things like this while they're performing their work. So if they do that correctly, again, they get points. So we created a lot of these very elaborate rubrics to look at the different tasks that they're performing in the process. And so when you collect this data and you actually do these assessments with the TA sitting there watching the students all day, you get graphs that look like this. And one of the important things about the BIOS program, uh, which I don't know if uh, Dr. Smith would relate to this or not, is that we give them multiple opportunities to perform the same operation because it's very rare that you learn a skill just trying it once, right? Usually you have to do it multiple times. And that's what you see here on the x-axis. So this is the first time we should try to grow bacteria, the second and the third. And pretty quickly, you can see that the students are going to learn different tasks at different rates. So for example, 
4A, picking the correct <coughs> bench. You can see immediately right from the get-go, they are getting 100% confidence. So on the, the y-axis here, this is the percent of students who are getting full points for that rubric item. So the higher, the better, 100% means all the students are doing it perfectly. So this becomes something that you know immediately, all right, they get that pretty quickly, they learn it pretty quickly. But then for the alcohol burner use, you can see that they start fairly low, about 40% confidence. And even after three trials, they're hanging somewhere around 70. So even not what we want. But again, this is very powerful because it informs you, all right, this is something maybe that they need to be reminded of again or to have more practice doing. So what this allows you to do then is to develop an evolving and self-regulating education process where you're getting immediate feedback about what's happening with the students, what they're learning and what they're not learning. And so you can adjust your teaching based on what you see. All right. So now here's the non-science example. So uh, in addition to running BIOS in Shanghai, I also am in charge of a language program in South Korea where we take Korean students and we try to teach them English. So it's an ESL, English to Second Language program. Okay, so no science here. But the same principles apply when you're trying to assess skills. So one of the skills that we want our ESL students to have is we want them to be able to write a good declarative sentence, which for us is mostly native speakers. You know, it's pretty easy, right? But when you actually break it down into the steps, it turns out that it gets more and more complicated. So as basic steps, you first have to follow certain applicable grammar rules. You then have to use the vocabulary correctly that you want to incorporate into your sentence. And then you have to be able to combine the grammar and the vocabulary in the right way to convey the, the meaning that you want. And here too, if you decompress one of these steps into a series of tasks, you find out pretty quickly that there are a lot of them. And again, as native speakers, we tend to take this for granted. But when it's a second language situation, these tasks become important. So for instance, students have to know to capitalize the first letter of the first word, not something you do in Korean. You have to finish the sentence with a period, have a subject, a verb, an object. You have to put them in the right order. So there are a lot of individual tasks that you have to have. And so here too, in this program, we have a very similar learning strategy. First, we have the students do a discussion about some kind of idea of writing. And then we introduce a grammar rule, something that we want them to practice getting right. So for instance, capitalizing the first letter. And then we want them to practice that rule in a workshop situation, which is a sandbox environment where we give them tailor-made problems to solve that allow them to directly practice this grammar rule that we're emphasizing. And then we have them continue that practice in regular daily writing activities. And again, when you collect this type of data, you can get graphs that look like this. So here the y-axis is different. This is the percent of wrong usage. So the higher this is, the not so nice it is. And then here, this is the time course of their practice. So the pre-discussion time point, this is before they do the discussion, before we teach them anything. And then these are the workshop, after each workshop time points. And then these numeric values are their sequential number of regular daily writing activities where they're practicing this rule. So here too, you very quickly see that they learn things at different rates. So for the period at the end of the sentence, um, they start out with about 11% wrong. Without any workshops, just with one discussion, it drops down below five, and then very quickly, with just a couple of writing activities, they get really close to zero, which is good. But then for other things, for instance, like the subject verb matching, so this is the, the tense matching, where uh, the verb tense has to match the plural or singular nature of the subject, so saying we are instead of we is. You can see that they start out with pretty high raw usage, over 25%, even after two workshops. And by the way, each workshop is like six or eight hours of time, a lot of time. They still barely get it down to about 14%. And it takes a lot of these subsequent writing activities to really bring it down to a high confidence level that we want. But again, the idea here is that if you collect this kind of data, you can see very clearly what's happening and what you need to do. So again, the take home message that I'd like you to have is that assessing skills is very different from assessing knowledge. And uh, as someone who works a lot with assessments, I think this is one of the, the burgeoning areas of research right now to try to have good rubrics and good systems to measure these competencies, not only about outcomes, but also about the process. Thank you.